When we begin to contemplate the mystery of value, perhaps we ought to pause for a second and consider words in the light of value. We have a wonder world of words, and many that we use every day could help us a great deal to understand the essential meanings of the things that happen to us and the circumstances which we transmit by means of word patterns and structures. For example, we have a word, liberal. Now, most persons like to be regarded as liberals. This may mean, politically, generous mindedness. The individual has escaped from extreme conservatism and uh, belongs rather to a democratic than an autocratic concept of living. The word liberal also suggests liberal mindedness in other ways, generosity of attitude, magnanimity of conduct, uh, sharing readily what we have with others. A liberal is a word we like to think about, and very few persons would resent being called liberal in some way, although like most semantic uh, terms, it has now developed some specialized meanings on which there is no general accord. But what does the word actually mean? And when we go to that, perhaps we drop out of the familiar. The word comes, of course, from the Latin liberalis, and it simply meant, originally, not a slave. Now that is, that is an interesting concept, a free man. It had really nothing to do with what you thought. It had to do with what you were. Now if you were free, you had certain privileges under Roman law. And if you were free, there were certain trades and crafts and professions that you could engage in, which was not permissible to a person not free, or a bondsman, or perhaps in the broadest speaking, a slave. A free man, for example, was permitted as a distinction, as an indication that he was free. He was permitted to train his mind. This was something that was discouraged in the slave at that time. So there was a line drawn which we would rather hate to think of today, but perhaps it won't hurt us. All such arts and crafts as resulted in profit only could be indulged in by slaves. But any art or craft which led to the improvement of consciousness could only be indulged in by a free man. Therefore, a liberal meant a liberated person. And as a reward of liberation, as a reward, he was entitled to be educated in such forms of knowledge as improved character rather than increased estate. Now, on that basis, what's happened to liberal? It's sort of gotten mixed up. If a person, by, by one of many circumstances, and the Romans kept the gate of liberty rather widely ajar, if for any reason a person became a free man, he might by this circumstance alone, achieve to that which probably was the greatest thing in the world for him. He could become a thinker. Today, the moment we get free from responsibility of any kind, we stop thinking. Thoughts are for people in trouble. Uh, thoughts are something that should be used only on rare occasions. 
And it's quite possible that even slaves use them as often as we do. But certainly we do not recognize liberty derived from the same word to simply mean the right to improve ourselves. Today we interpret this term largely as the right to luxury, the right to be considered as good as anybody else, in our own estimation a little better. It is the right to, to have what we want. It is the right of free enterprise. It has very little to do with the ancient meaning that it was the right to grow. Now, when a man was free, he was permitted to indulge in the studies of what are now called the liberal arts. Now, liberal art simply means an art that a free man could practice. That is exactly what it meant to the Roman. Therefore, the liberal arts were those which were permissible to any person born free or who had attained freedom by any of the various courses open under Roman law. Liberal arts, then, were not liberal-minded arts or generous arts. They were arts for free men. And these arts included, in the Roman concept of things, grammar, rhetoric, logic, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. These were the liberal arts. And when we get a Bachelor of Arts today in the university, it is presumed that we have qualified in some program bearing upon the arts that were open to free men. This sort of carries into our general thinking value. Here is an expre expression of a meaning of value which we may not generally consider. We value liberty. And this means, actually, that we value the right to devote a major part of our lives to study and self-improvement. That by circumstances which are equivalent to freedom, but circumstances often which we have to earn for ourselves, the individual through his labor earns the right to unfold his own consciousness. He has a body which will always be a bondsman, because the very concerns of the body are the concerns of those that are not free. Man who is in slavery to his own body is also a bondsman. But the individual who has a life in consciousness apart from body, that man is free. And this is the message of the word which we have called liberal. And it gives us a very good concept in relationship to Shabui, or this Kihin that we talked about earlier. This uh, problem of moral beauty, this problem of adorning the life with the ornaments of cultural attainment. We want to live as far as we can in this world graciously. We want to live beautifully. Uh, we want to live in an atmosphere that is compatible with peace of mind and serenity of spirit. To achieve this end, we must perform some action that is apt or likely to result in the state of consciousness which we desire. We all know that a life undisciplined, undirected, and uncontrolled seldom attains any enduring value. It does not have pleasantness of years. It does not give us freedom from the importuning circumstances of the day. It does not give us happiness or contentment or peace of mind. Therefore, a life of value 
must be so controlled and directed that it becomes a valuable life. A life not only valuable to ourselves, but a life valuable to others. For we are never really happy unless we are doing something that is really meaningful. Any other ta form of recreation uh, is rather hollow before we finish with it all. How to achieve, then, a life of value? Our great, com our great problem today is complication. The life of value must be a simple life. Now, a simple life in our generation and in our Western civilization is rather difficult to envision. We are actually born with a sense of tension and confusion hanging over us. We live every day and hour in the midst of sound and fury. For us to achieve natural simplicity, uh, to be able to have quietude of consciousness, just seems about impossible. Yet it is not as impossible or as difficult as we would first imagine. The natural beginnings of a life of value include the decision uh, to cling to value, uh, to make some uh, uh, compromise of some nature with materiality, by means of which it is not all possessing, by which it is not all dominating in our experience and in our way of living. Happiness arises very largely from our ability to appreciate simple, natural, and gracious things. Happiness is not very often to be associated with the gratification of elaborate tastes. Happiness is appreciation. It is the recognition of the dignity of the available. It is not this headlong dash after the unattained. The life of value is the life that is immediately lived with a sense of value. A life that is valuable every moment because we are continually experiencing something of importance. Uh, to achieve this level, therefore, we must be ever watchful for value. We must seek value in everything that happens, for value is there. And as we are able to take problems and transmute them into value, the problem itself grows less and the value grows greater. We are all constantly in the midst of valuable experience. But for the most part, we do not benefit by it, nor are we grateful for it. We are usually most grateful for that which is least valuable. We are not glad because we remember, we are glad because we forget. We do not live with the constant attention and responsiveness to that which is fine or proper or noble or beautiful. Yet we have the faculties which enable us to live this way, and we know that other persons have achieved it. We also realize that what we call aesthetic value has been associated with art. But we are further aware that many artists never possess it, that many artists are, are simply craftsmen who are able by some mechanical ingenuity in themselves to create harmonious designs, and yet whose lives are not harmonious and whose actual personal existence is heavily plagued with the same problems as the less artistic. Therefore, skill in art is not necessarily a guarantee of value. Nowhere do we find in any institution that we have created anything which guarantees the transmission of value. We may give our lives to religion, and we may really very seriously work with the subject and yet we may come to the end of our days without ever having been religious. We may give our lives to philosophy, and yet at the end of our life again, we die unphilosophically. 
Thus we cannot assume that any system will automatically and inevitably bestow value. Value in every instance is something that we must contribute. We might say something like a problem in music. We go to a great concert. There is a fine orchestra and a leading conductor. The compositions that are played are by master composers. The entire occasion exposes us to a great deal of musical sublimity. I remember distinctly uh, attending a concert in which, among other things, uh, there was a marvelous rendition of parts of the opera Siegfried. One scene being, of course, the casting of the great sword, Notong. And this was uh, not really dramatized, but it was sung out well with a few gestures. And the artist turned in uh, a very adequate performance. When it was all over, a man sitting near to me observed in a stage whisper uh, to someone next to him, Thank God that blacksmith has stopped. That's all it meant. There was just simply no sense of the importance of music. The individual was exposed, but it didn't take. And uh, when we are in exposed to bacteria, it nearly always does take. But when we are uh, exposed to culture, we seem to have an extraordinary degree of immunity. This situation shows that culture, that uh, value, cannot be simply bestowed by one who possesses it. If value could be bestowed, religion would have saved the world thousands of years ago, philosophy would have brought us to the golden age, and even the greatest advancements in science couldn't cripple us too much. We would be in with some security. But it just is not to be communicated in this way. Value, therefore, must always involve the power of the person to recognize the valuable, to give something of himself to the compound of the circumstance that arises, so that there is a sympathy, a blending of understandings, a meeting of minds or of hearts, for without the appreciation of the person, value cannot perform its perfect work. Now, appreciation is another thing, which is a word much used, but not too well understood or uh, applied. To appreciate something, we must understand. Appreciation must follow some inward experience of our own. We cannot appreciate unless that which we appreciate is to a measure able to reach us as living persons and touch us and do something to us. We may say, therefore, with the Neoplatonists that value is the result of something that is valuable. Uh, receiving to itself the instinct of value in us. We must move out to embrace the valuable. We must have an instinctive skill, an instinctive and insatiable appetite, which can never be satisfied except when it reaches and takes hold of value. If we work upon the problem in this way, we also gradually come to the principles of the simplification of things. The value consciousness in man does not rejoice in the elaborate or the complicated or the grandiose. Man himself is by nature a simple creature. And complication rests uncomfortably upon him at all times, leading to confusion and discord. The natural human instinct is for the simple, the immediate, 
and the imminent. We, we like value that is understandable, and it must be simple if we are to understand it. If then we are in the presence of the grand, we are overawed, we are impressed, but it is as though we were seated before more food than we could eat, and having made, made gluttons of ourselves, find only discomfiture. True value has to be something uh, that nourishes without overdoing this process of nutrition. That is why uh, we have to use some instrument by which we can measure value and discover it in our own lives. The greatest exponents of this concept of value that we know have been the Oriental peoples especially those who lived a rather simple and severe kind of life. A great students of art today, for example, look upon the arts of China. They look back into the uh, pre-Christian period. They look back into the great dynasties uh, that gave the world Confucius and Lao Tse, and even further back into the long, mysterious shadows of the Shang dynasty, a dynasty which has only but slightly appeared historically and is mostly wrapped in that strange oblivion which hides the origins of things. But out of this very early period has come some marvelous artifacts, magnificent pieces of bronze, wonderful fragments of ancient stone carving, simple, austere, uh, plain, but magnificent of line, a clean, wonderful, immediate grasp of value. Somewhere back in those days, there were great artists. Perhaps in those times they did not even know they were great artists. One uh, well-known expert in Chinese art tried to explain it. He said, we can come to only one conclusion, that those people back there were great because they had not been taught not to be great. They hadn't been ruined. Those artisans never went to school, even a school of art. They did not learn to draw. They did not belong to a tradition. We do not know how they worked, perhaps by themselves perhaps under some small guild or clan, but certainly nothing had interfered with their natural creativity. They proved to us beyond doubt that man anciently knew what was good, whether he knew that he knew or not. Probably he did not know. But he was a simple person, and he made something, and he looked at it, and he said, I don't like it. So he tossed it on the rubbish heap. A little later, he made something else, looked at that for a while, showed it to a few of his friends, and he said, I do like it. Therefore, he kept it. This was what we might term higher criticism. This was the way it was when the individual simply felt what was right and felt what was wrong. So we come down through the great days of Chinese art, and we come down maybe to the three dynasties, or we come to the beginning of the great way cycle of art, uh, which arose from the Han and dominated Chinese culture in the opening centuries of the Christian era. Here we find still the marvelous simplicity, the wonderful massing of design the total lack of detail, the perfect shaping of things, the perfect sense of rightness, where even looking at it now with all that we know, we couldn't improve on it. For some unknown reason and by some mystery, the old artist put each area which he specialized exactly where it most belonged. It couldn't be anywhere else and be right. Then we go on a little further, and gradually we see the rise of the Tang dynasty around the 6th century. And here we begin to see still many great things, but something that indicates loss. 
In the beginning of the Tang, something happened to Chinese art. The robes got too many folds in them. The stones had too many figures on them. The inscriptions became too flowery. The massing was no longer. The strange, severe, marvelous simplicity of ancient days. It is not remarkable then that the masters of the Tang dynasty began to copy the older pieces. And later the masters of the Song, who got worse still, began copying the Tang. Anything to find a purity, to get back to something else. For by the Song dynasty, things were getting pretty badly cluttered. And by the days of the Ming, which was a very long dynasty, which progressively decreased in value. We really were in a situation that was just about as tragic as the problem of art during the reigns of the Louis of France. In the Ming, everything was overdone. All of the great line was gone. Paint and color and inlay began to appear. And a little later, in the Qing, we just went completely crazy and Shiner's art fell apart. Little by little, over a period of time, it got worse and worse and worse. Why did this happen? It apparently happened because somewhere man began to cater to something beside his own instincts. Perhaps he catered to profit. And perhaps he tried to please ambitious, luxury-loving rulers. Perhaps tastes became more complicated as they grew more decadent. But physical luxury, the rise of a great aristocracy, seemed to destroy the integrity of primitive art. Men began to buy things because they were expensive, or to make things because they were profitable. And instantly, culture began to fade. So in our search for value, we see everywhere in art that the great art that is most collected today by great critics and great connoisseurs is early, back in the time when men made simple forms that refresh the spirit. And even today, as we touch them, we feel a tremendous benevolent influence. But little by little, this influence is lost through the complicating processes of society. All this simply points out that with the rise of luxury and complexity, value diminishes. And with the loss of value comes the loss of culture, comes the decline of liberties, comes the end of respects and honors, and the simple code that Confucius and Mencius taught in China 2,400 years ago or more, has ceased. The simple dignities of life are gone. And gradually China came into the terrible condition which afflicted it in the opening years of the present century, a condition which undoubtedly precipitated the tragic condition which we now know as China. So we need this sense of the simplicity, the search for the simple thing. The Chinese simplicity was shifted to Japan. And while Japan gradually became more and more influenced by Tang and Sung and Ming art from China, the people of Japan were just a little different in nature. They had another religion which helped them out, and that was Shinto. And Shinto was a religion of austerity. It wasn't a religion of self-sacrifice or martyrdom or self-denial, but it was a religion which preached the value of nature, that nothing that man could ever do would be as beautiful as a natural thing which creation had, got, had done for him, that all the works of art could scarcely equal a tree, and that man everywhere found his most perfect expression by adjusting himself to nature and becoming, in a sense, sensitive uh, to the universal order of things. That this was far more important than building a great superficial culture of his own. 
As a result, uh, the quality of Shibui has definitely lingered there, although with a little longer contact with the West, their culture will probably collapse also because they are moving gradually onto an efficiency basis. And efficiency is apparently the end of culture. And to a measure, as we know it today, efficiency is the end of comfort and convenience because we become so obsessed with certain processes that we can no longer enjoy life even with comforts, which other people have never had. So our life of value has something to do with simplicity and the appreciation of simplicity. So we can start studying this in our own particular environment. I, I would suggest that uh, sometime, as we recommended before, that each of you try to uh, make a, a sumi drawing or uh, to make it the simplest possible thing use a blank paper, a piece of paper and a ballpoint pen. Take five simple lines or simple uh, form line structures. Make a little design on a piece of paper in which you place five lines in what you regard as harmonic relationship with each other. Use a straight line and a curve and perhaps a broken line, uh, make a little design of five lines, something you would like to think as a picture. Try and draw a tree with five lines. Hokusai, the great uh, Japanese artist in his manga, his textbook, drew hundreds of bird forms, each one of these with one line only. Now there is perfect economy. And yet each of these one-line birds is a real bird, a delightful thing. If we went after that, we would make 500 fussy little lines, rub two-thirds of them out and start over again, and end up by throwing the whole business in the wastebasket. That is the way we would approach it. But make a little drawing of three or four lines and just say to yourself, relax and then say to yourself, do I like it? Is this little sketch well balanced? Is it nice? Is it really good? And in the most cases, if we're honest, we'll realize that we don't operate with much of that quality we associate with Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, the five-line drawing will not be tremendous. The bird won't look exactly like a bird. Uh, we won't be too happy over it. We may wonder for a moment that we did as well as we could, but a little later we'll find we could do better if we, if we really put our hearts and minds on it. But see if you, in some simple thing, can actually create a simple form of some kind that looks sufficient to your consciousness. Try a little flower arrangement. That's very easy here in California. Take a small, simple, plain bowl. Remember that you are not going to use the bowl to be impressive. You're not going to say people are going to look at it because the bowl costs $20. The bowl should cost 10 or 15 cents, maybe 50 cents if you get real opulent. But certainly... Uh, it should cost 50 cents or no more. Maybe at the moment the prices will be inflated. But it should be very simple. The bowl should do nothing but not interfere. In it you arrange a half a dozen flowers or leaves, buds, branches, twigs, anything that pleases you. Arrange it as nicely as you can put it by itself on a little stand where you can look at it without seeing anything else. It's not really very attractive to catch a whole group of fleur-de-lis in the wallpaper behind it. Just put it someplace where it is plain. Sit back and say, would you like to live with it? I suspect that you will creep away and the arrangement will disappear as soon as possible. You won't really like to live with it you will find that it doesn't really please you. 
something's wrong with it. Uh, you look at a book and maybe where some Japanese has made some flower arrangements, you say, mine doesn't look like that. Anything they do seems to be right. Anything I do seems to be wrong. This is an important discovery. This is the beginning of a quest for value. What did you do that was wrong? Or as you go along, if you find an arrangement which by intent or circumstance happened to be good, what did you do that was right? How do you proceed with this so that you finally reach a condition in which you say, this pleases me? This fulfills something. I have expressed beauty and I know it. There's no way of finding out except to try. Now, there are many other ways in which we also try to express beauty. Uh, in many countries, this expression is instinctive. All you have to do is give the individual the materials and he will do it. In this country, that type of expression is not in, uh, natural. It is not instinctive. It's something that you have to more or less discipline yourself to appreciate. Yet this discipline is the basis of moral control of life. All good things for Western man begin with self-discipline. And the reason why it is so necessary is because Western man has never permitted himself uh, to obey cheerfully. He has always regarded leadership as his divine right and that others should obey him. We have not learned the dignity and importance of obeying law or obeying principles or recognizing that we live in a universe in which certain things are right and certain things are wrong. And it is up for, to us to find out what is right and do that. This kind of thinking is not natural to our tastes. We have to acquire it in some way. The beginning of all acquirement is interest. If we don't want to acquire, we never will. If we want to, this desire must be warmed until it leads us to an action that will further the desire. Now, every person, as we have said uh, in other uh, talks of this series, is in need of value at the present time. And uh, in the Oriental mind, value is very close to meditation. Value is a rapport. It is an experience. It is something that makes life richer and better, more gracious for us. A value is always the doing of the small thing beautifully. It is the recognition of the dignity of detail. Not to cover a thing with detail, but to discover the importance of the small actions which make up life the small decisions which each one of us must uh, face. Now, one of the most annoying things that some people experience, for example, in Japan, is the insistent habit the Japanese people have of bowing over the telephone. This, to us, is just carrying it all just a little too far. But a long-distance conversation may be considerably longer in time than in distance. By the time each individual has greeted the other person and bowed eight or ten times in t front of the telephone, the three minutes is well more than up. And no one has gotten around to the conversation yet. Now, if you told these people that bowing over the telephone really wasn't quite necessary, they would agree with you. But to bow has been part of their lives for thousands of years. It has been innate in them to pay tribute to the dignity and the life and heart of another person. The other person, of course, is returning it with interest. Uh, this bowing is a mass of mutual admiration. Perhaps they've forgotten what it means, but they've never forgotten to do it. They've never forgotten uh, this peculiar little niceness, which we would have absolutely no time for. Well, there's no reason why we should, in the West, the way we think and live, take time for it. We just simply move on to things. But something is lost. Perhaps in the process of this bowing, which in itself is perhaps only a minor form of exercise, 
there is something else involved. Perhaps this little pause gives us a chance uh, to organize our own consciousness a little better. Perhaps if we bowed ten times over the phone ourselves, we wouldn't say some of the things we say over the phone. Nor would we be utterly unreasonable and tie up a party line when there's a sick child in someone else's family, which happened not long ago here, and the child died. We wouldn't be this way if in some mysterious manner these little courtesies were alive. These little courtesies are key, moral value. They mean that everything we do in life, we do with thoughtfulness. And the moment we do things with thoughtfulness, mysterious values open up that we, we wouldn't otherwise ever notice. The life that's lived in haste is always a life that misses value. We mentioned a moment ago the great Japanese woodblock artist Hokusai. In the course of his career, when he was over 70 years old, he did his wonderful group of woodcut drawings of Mount Fuji. Uh, Fuji-san, or Mr. Fuji, is to the Japanese the supreme mountain, the mysterious symbol of absolute aesthetic excellence. The extraordinary symmetry of the cone is certainly well known all over the world. But Hokusai made a whole collection of prints upon the light motive of Fuji. It ran through every one of them. And he contrived countless ways to show the mountain in the, in the midst of other situations. One scene, we see the peak through a spider's web. And a leaf has fallen on the web. In another view, we see the peak reflected on the surface of the tea in an elderly gentleman's teacup. In another scene, we see a man making a barrel, and we see Fuji through the open end of the barrel. It comes to us from behind groups of parasols drying in the sun. It stands alone in solemn grandeur in the midst of rain that seems to cover it and haze it with shadow. It also is seen through the, the loop of a great wave, the spray of which is changing into little birds that fly away. Everywhere this mountain comes back, simply because to this artist, this mountain was absolutely shippowy. It was the highest, most perfect, controlled thing he could conceive of. And in art, he could not think of a symbol that to him carried with it such extraordinary beauty. So we had there are parties in Japan still every year. Groups go out and spend the day Fuji viewing. This is, this is enough. They take lunch, write poetry, and look at the mountains. This is happiness, this is peace, this is contentment. We couldn't do so well with a $5,000 car and a $500 outlay for the afternoon. To them, there is a certain refreshment from nature, a refreshment from man taking into himself the, the majesty of the universe. And this is important to the life of value. The life of value which must begin to be taught to children, where things seen are not just things, but they are living symbols of universal principles. They make us feel better. They give us new dedications and new consecrations. They make us more friendly. And they overcome the tendency to insomnia and nervous tension with which we are afflicted. To live in the light of value, therefore, means simply to allow the light of the sun to strike things and reveal them. Uh, the uh, 7th and 8th century Buddhist artists, artists frequently represented the figure of the uh, Buddha Amida as a sunrise coming over the mountains. Uh, this great haloed head 
arising between the great peaks of hills, and the light of the nimbus shining down and touching the rocks and the trees and the river, the river and the waterfalls. All of these things moving gradually into visibility in the light of Amida's radiance. Amida simply represents the internal consciousness of man. And as the light of this consciousness shines out, it touches all the darkness, not physical darkness, but aesthetic darkness, with which our lives are burdened. And in the light of this inner illumination, everything becomes beautiful. And this beauty moves and changes with the light until finally the full radiance of the majesty of high noon exposes the full picture. So this uh, uh, sense of allowing the light in the self to bring out the shapes and forms and patterns of natural beauty, this was distinctly an Asiatic concept. Westerns have had it, but not to any great degree. In the West we have considered art as belonging to artists. In the East, it is considered that art is absolutely necessary to rich and poor, educated and uneducated, that every human being has a life in art, and that to discover this and to live according to it is to have a full life that is not dependent for its fullness upon what we have, but upon the continual expansion of what we are. To live a life in value or in the light of value has certain compensations. And uh, we find this type of thinking uh, in another Oriental artist, Hiroshigi. Hiroshigi, as far as we can learn, was simply what was called in Japan in his time a Yedo man. He was an artist in Tokyo, no better and no worse than his contemporaries as far as his personal life was concerned. And after he had lived a fair life as a very great artist and an interesting, informal, friendly human being, a life, incidentally, which was heavily burdened with poverty and other limitations uh, of a world in transition because he flourished at a time when the old Japanese economy was falling apart. But in any event, uh, Hiroshigi had a life in value. And his value was that he could go out along the Tokaido, the great road that led from Yedo to Kyoto, and he could stop anywhere along the road and see great beauty. He could take any step of this incredible journey from, two great, from one great city to another. He could pause anywhere frame it with a scratch pad, and in a few seconds, every scene was magnificent. He wasn't always superlative, but in every series of his great paintings, uh, there were masterpieces. And these masterpieces were based upon the most simple themes. Uh, uh, two peasants hastening home across a bridge in the rain. Uh, someone sitting down, uh, warming himself on a fire by, uh, by a fire along the side of a road. Always, however, he captured an exquisite composition, simply because he was conscious of it. To him, everything became a picture, and every picture was beautiful. Well, some of us have this picture-making propensity also. But when we want to make a record of the Tokaido, today we would just use a camera. We'd never draw it ourselves. And incidentally, as several people have pointed out, it's hard to get a good picture along the Tokaido today because you're going by at 60 miles an hour. Of course you won't get a picture. You won't get any keen out of life by these two procedures. First, rushing across the scenery or today above it at 600 miles an hour, or trying to preserve the record of beauty with a camera. Cameras have their place. No one denies it. 
But somehow, it's when you sit quietly by the road with the sketch pad that, and create. You always make a few little differences. The camera is not the same as artist, as a great artist. It, a good artist can get much more from a camera. But somehow, great art has a little tendency to simplify, to make certain minor changes that bring a pattern into particular harmony, to convey the true impression, which perhaps some accidental circumstance has distorted. But you have to have this slow journey through beauty in order to pause long enough to be touched by it. Uh, to be moved into some maturity of consciousness. Uh, before Hiroshige died, uh, he's pointed out, he said, that he was fortunate that the length of his life had been equal to the stations of the Tokaido. In other words, he likened the journey of life to the trip from Yedo to Kyoto that in these wave stations, these little inns where men stop to rest, all the way along this road with its wonderful changing scenery, its little villages, its meetings of sea and mountain, its ancient temples, its wayside shrines, and every so often a little monument standing there, perhaps to Jizo, the, the protector of little children, or perhaps simply a monument that says, we do not know who passed this way, but God bless them. Now, there is something rather charming about all that, and we, we just have hastened ourselves out of it. Now, no one says we can settle down and make that marvelous journey along the Tokaido from here to Pasadena. That is not the, the thing we're trying to bring home. But what we are trying to bring home is that man even though he must adapt his daily life very largely to the pressures of his time, he can take certain time out of his life, if he wants to, to make these quiet little journeys in consciousness, if they carry him only in his mind along some pleasant road. There is always time for the little journey in the self, the little thought into a better world, there is always time to reflect upon what appears to be a rather crude and unpleasant circumstance and suddenly see it as Hiroshige might have seen it, a thing of great beauty. Or as Hokusai painted Fuji, one day in great storm, one day in great eruption, one time when floods are tearing down the sides of it, but with it all its sublimity unchanged. So there's, there are always ways we can get inside of things and back of them and make them more valuable to us as spiritual experience. And I have always believed that this kind of an approach is easier, more gracious, and more natural than this desperate effort to be good which has deformed people since the beginning of history. There is nothing that is more miserable than a person making a valiant effort to be good. And very seldom does this misery suffer alone. It nearly always involves other people, until finally the whole community wishes that there was no more goodness for these people to try to imitate. If instead of that attitude, we did have more of this concept of graciousness, of value. We would quietly achieve good without being noticeably obnoxious in the procedure. We would find that our consciousness was maturing without inhibition, without frustration. We would see that we are becoming better people, not because we are trying to be good, but simply because we are trying to understand values. We are trying to make use of the faculties with which we have been endowed. And if we use the faculties well, we will be good, in the truest sense of the word. We will not be trying to assume virtues, we will be experiencing them. And in so doing, 
will enrich our own lives and enrich the lives of others instead of becoming a nuisance to all concerned. So in this process of value, of moral value, of living on it, I think we should try with all the simple things at our disposal. One thing that we have learned in the West and are beginning to realize more than ever before is that haste does not mean the good use of time. Today, haste is one of the most expensive habits we have ever developed. Haste costs us more than we possibly save. It means things poorly done. It means inadequate workmanship and craftsmanship. Things fall apart. Haste is not a saving, it is a wasting. And in personal living, this is also true. The individual who is constantly, desperately hurrying in order that he may get more into his life is accomplishing the exact opposite result. The more he hastens, the less there is in his life. Oh, we may say that we don't want to spend hours and hours at tasks that do not require that length of time. At tasks, no. But at meaning, how better can we spend the time? What are we going to do with this time that we have so desperately saved at the expense of quality, at the expense of thought, and expense of meaning in everything? We're going to sit down in front of the television and watch several people bombard each other at close range. This is about all we're going to do. We're not going to do anything important. We're not hastening because we expect to change the course of history when we get through with the present job. We are hastening because we are moving from one boring situation into another. So why not pause and give the thing a little greater thought? Actually, people in uh, crafts and trades who are more or less experienced have realized that quiet, methodical work is the quickest. That things done well do not have to be done again. That things done thoughtfully become joys in themselves. Thus we must break down a psychological barrier between what is enjoyable and what is drudgery. Today, to most people, anything they have to do is... He saw its potentials. He saw its meaning. And he transformed uh, something that was apparently worthless into a thing of great worth because of his own understanding. Sometimes he was able to insinuate a wonderful whimsical quality. Sometimes he caricatured. Sometimes he released a great reverence through what he did. But everything that he saw was interesting. And as a result of that, there were no longer any flat places in his universe at all. And this again has to do with the concept of value. So that we can uh, not judge things to be valuable because of a social status but things of value because they're meaningful. And when we travel, for instance, among Oriental peoples again, I think in China we find a good deal of this, and also in Korea and Japan, the value, for example, of something as commonplace as cooking suddenly becomes tremendous. The Zen monk will tell you that illumination can occur in the kitchen much more frequently than it will in the living room. Why? Because you are, you are working with values. And when a Chinese dinner is prepared, the first thing it is, it must appear to be a work of art. I don't know exactly what Hiroshige would think of a television uh, frozen plate ensemble, but I rather suspect that it would turn his stomach. He would have a really hard time finding the value in that one. He probably could do it, but it would really take work. But to the Oriental, the first part of a good meal 
is its appearance. The food comes in with every indication that it has been put there by somebody who wanted it to be there, who enjoyed putting it there, and who found a great deal of self-expression in transforming this plate into a work of art. There was real loving artistry there. Now we have no time for that. But what else are we doing with the time? Nothing. But we just figure that that kind of time is something we should get away from just as quickly as possible. That isn't good time. That's burden. Now the next thing that the Orientals will do will tell you that when you have stopped looking at this plate, the aroma of it is going to rise to your nostrils. And as the Chinese say, the good meal must smell like the incense of heaven. Well now, I don't know as many of our cookbooks give the recipe for that, but it means that we are also thinking in terms of the aromas of food. And when we get past the aroma of food, then we, we come to the next situation that comes, uh, very important, the eyes, color, color, certain colors must go together. You do not uh, put a wilted mashed potato alongside of a dilapidated turnip, <laughs> both of which looked they were as though they were much too much the worse for too long residence in the deep freeze. Uh, we don't do that. There has to be artistry. Then texture. When you start biting it, it must not all bite like stale gravy. You, uh, it, should, it should be flavorable. It should be these things. And if it is these things, then it is a work of art. If it is a work of art, it is soul culture. And also, it's quite possible that if it looks well, tastes well, we know the person who did it enjoyed doing it, the foods are well combined, and our whole nature is happy, it might even prevent ulcers. Because we would have pleasure, and we know that everything involved was pleasant. Now, the Oriental cooks his food very quickly, he does not cook it too much. Most of his food is a little to us on the undercooked side. But he preserves crispness and flavor and shape. He doesn't boil out color. And he doesn't put in a little of this and a little of that to restore the color artificially. He does it very simply, very quickly, and it is a lovely meal. This is moral value. It is a thing he enjoys. It has become an essential part of his life to think this way and to live this way. It is clothing the same way. One of the great problems that we have faced in the West is this constant shifting of styles, most of which are utterly unflattering. Uh, in most other countries, the folk costuming of the people for centuries maintained quality, artistry, and suitability. There was very little competition in the uh, individual consciousness. Good clothes never went out of style. There was no waste of money or waste of time involved. In Japan today, children going to school wear uniforms. Now, the uniform is uh, perhaps a little dated, perhaps a little strange. But what does it mean? The Japanese answered it very definitely. No more broken-hearted school children because they can't buy the expensive clothes that other school children wear. It doesn't make any difference whether you're the uh, daughter of the prime minister or the daughter of the most common laborer. You dress alike. There is no broken-hearted laborer's daughter that has to be contended with later. These things are, are very simple. And we never get around to them. We have to keep life complicated. Ultimately, we have to grow up some way. We have to mature into something besides a frenzied rush toward an unknown destiny. If we keep on this way, we will not even live to die in peace. We will more or less fall apart en route. 
there won't be very many people in our generation who will be able to accomplish what Grandma Moses did, and I understand that she passed today at 101. She had been in this world since the administration of Abraham Lincoln. She must have seen a great many changes. And I imagine that she would be one who would admit that some of these changes were not all they should have been. But in uh, trying to build back into our lives, each person has something that is his own, if it's only a 12-foot room. He has a little world in which he can do what he pleases, if it pleases him to do anything. He can bring something of grace into his personal life. I know individuals who, for example, uh, travel a great deal. Some of them have no real homes at all, but they are art lovers, and wherever they go, they carry something by which, in an instant, they can bring art to a hotel room, or a boarding house, or a motel, wherever they are. They bring something that is essentially shibui with them. They carry it as religiously as they carry their extra clothes. And they would rather be caught without their extra clothes than not to have this something that moves a universe of value into their lives. And there is no one who cannot do these things to some degree. And there is no reason why it should ever really cause very much consternation. Many of these things can be done entirely privately, and yet they mean the difference between a, a conscious restatement every day of a conviction and the uh, problem of allowing ourselves to drift into utter mediocrity. So living constantly in the presence of value means that we are always ready to sacrifice a little something for the niceness of something that we do, something that we have, something that we believe. And little by little, this type of life does insinuate itself into all parts of our consciousness. If the mere accumulation of something of value merely left us the same and the proud owners of something, it would have no meaning. But as we sacrifice for value, as we gradually gain the ability to discriminate between those things which are most satisfying to consciousness. When we achieve this, uh, we begin to change our temperaments. Our tempers begin to relax a little. Our attitudes become a little more harmonious. For once the artist is born in our souls, we cannot do things that are not artistic. Criticism is not artistic. Criticism isn't beautiful. Criticism will never make a wonderful picture of Fuji against the sky. Criticism is something that deforms and shatters and breaks. Therefore, we cannot afford it. And as we begin to sense the possibility of true peace within ourselves, we don't want to disturb it by such attitudes. Intolerance isn't beautiful. It adds nothing. It may satisfy a momentary whim, but all it does is break a beautiful image of some kind. Intolerance makes us poorer, makes us cheaper in our own consciousness. And once we begin to value consciousness, we do not want this kind of a situation to arise. Hypocrisy is the same. We cannot live with it. We become more and more dependent upon an orderly existence. We do not wish to experience certain things. If we have to, we will, but we don't choose to. In Japan, Zen has for many years, for centuries, been the philosophic belief of the military sect of Japan. These were people who had to fight and die for their lords, their daimyos, and their tycoons. These people didn't always have the opportunity to live peacefully, but they did have the privilege of living graciously and dying graciously. They made life into one pattern of value to them. And this value meant to these people 
that most of all they must be true to that which they regarded as most valuable. If they regarded honor as most valuable, they had to be willing to die for it. If they had uh, believed religion to be most valuable, as in the case of several emperors, several emperors of the Fujiwara dynasty, after they reached a certain age, absolutely, voluntarily abdicated and became monks. They didn't want to hold on to this temporal power to the last day of life. They didn't want to hold on to wealth until it was tucked away in the casket with them. They reached a certain point. They had lived a fairly useful or busy and perhaps eventful life. They simply turned to the court around them and said, Gentlemen, I am retiring. The remaining years of my life I shall give to meditation and prayer and to the cultivation of the beauty of my own soul. This is now far more important than ruling a kingdom. And they meant it, and they did it. We talk about it, but very seldom do we do these things, because we would like to cling to something that is not value. As we get older, the need for value becomes perhaps even more pressing upon us. Our ambitions begin to slip away, the probabilities of the vast projects that we started with have become dim, our own energies are not, sub, are not suitable to maintain the tempo with which we have associated successful living, and so it is very important that we begin to develop value. It is necessary that we retire from the world as Hiroshige did and take holy orders. But it is very suitable for us uh, to begin to be more and more conscious of value. Uh, be conscious of these things which are satisfying to consciousness and which will help us uh, to uh, meet the long afternoon of years with real composure, real understanding, and real peace of soul. So value becomes increasingly significant to Western man because he really has never known much about it. And this program and everything it has to do with it certainly has to be spearheaded by thoughtful people. And I have wondered over many years how it is that so few people interested in philosophy or interested in mysticism or even esotericism have sensed the, the tremendous advantage of the simple love of beauty in the development of the spiritual life. Uh, rather they have followed the traditional pattern of Western man and rather made, beauty, made uh, the religious life unbeautiful. They felt that it had to be a severity, a penance, uh, that the holy images had to be symbols of deprivation and pain. They have never really sort of sensed that the good life, the spiritual life, the life which unfolds the internal power of man is the beautiful and the gracious life. They have, they have not sensed that goodness and beauty have an essential identity. And as a result, the, uh, the goodness gets a rather cramped appearance and loses most of its immediate charm. Also, uh, the individual himself can't get the same enthusiasm about being uncomfortable that he might get out of the expression of his own aesthetic consciousness. Archetypally, we do possess within ourselves something uh, that within the next 25 years, it is my solemn prediction, is going to dominate the entire field of scientific research, and that is the quest of the core consciousness in man. Psychology is already bankrupt as far as its present patterns are concerned. It cannot and does not go far enough. It must go further. And as it goes further, what is it going to find? It is inevitably going to be forced to approach what might be called the unit consciousness which lies behind all the phenomena of the human mind and of the entire series of psychic reflexes in man. It's all right to talk about the id and the libido. It's all right to talk about the anima and the animus. It is all right to consider the numerous divisions of the human psyche. But behind and beyond this, there is the unity of consciousness upon which, these, upon which these depend for their existence. 
there is a oneness at the root of diversity and this oneness is consciousness and it is this consciousness that must be found that must be understood before the purpose for man's existence can be defined now this consciousness is not really, as the Zen monk has pointed out, not really as inaccessible as we have made it appear to be. We have surrounded this consciousness with a mass of, st of straw men, images that we have built up which we have now to knock down before we can get to the facts. We have placed in our own estimation between consciousness and our daily living a vast interval of complexities and we have been uh, gradually groping our way through these complexities and every time we touch another complexity we think this is the ultimate it is not behind it lies this great sea of simplicity which is consciousness itself we can and must learn how to get this consciousness into action it is there, it is naturally and inevitably like water flowing downhill, moving into our objective existence. And then somewhere along the line we distort it, deform it, mutilate it so that by the time it gets into manifestation it is comparatively meaningless to us. Uh, we do the same thing in ourselves. We have a root consciousness which we do not understand and do not know. And by the time it has passed through the mental and emotional complexes of our personality, it has become a completely deformed thing, incapable of providing us with any basic integration, but simply animating a mass of complexes. The uh, Oriental mind knew this, recognized it, Buddha realized it 2,600 years ago. He knew there was only one answer to this. And that is that the individual must begin to make possible the manifestation of this inner consciousness through a relaxed, available human personality. That if we use consciousness, consciousness will become beautiful in us. If we abuse it, it will become a deformed thing, leading us to sickness and destruction. So we must find this consciousness. And the only way we can think of it and the way we believe it is that this consciousness is the archetypal universal life. It is also carrying within itself the absolute law of its own existence. Therefore, consciousness per se is absolute life, absolute law, and absolute order. What does this mean in substance? It simply means that it is absolute beauty. For law is the basis of beauty. And beauty is lawfulness. It is the thing as it should be and as it must be. And those who are able to dis discover the highest standards of beauty are those who have come the nearest to sensing the real structure of universal law it would then seem quite reasonable and probable that if we are able to release these patterns into conduct that we will not have these psychic stress situations that we now go through. We go through the conflict between an eternal pattern that must have its own and our purposes which are in conflict with this pattern and our psychic life is a battlefield for the rest of our years. If, however, we seek the life of value, we stop dictating to consciousness. We stop telling consciousness what it is supposed to believe, which actually is pure audacity because we have no idea of what it is supposed to believe. And we become receptive to allow consciousness to express its own divine geometry in our minds, in our emotions, and in our actions. Actually, the appreciation of beauty is due to the consciousness we possess. The creation of beauty is due to consciousness. And the life of beauty is a life lived in consciousness, with the values of the inner dominating the problems of the outer.
If we can ever get into this situation, we have reasonable security. We will not be perfect. Man is not yet fashioned for such ends. But we will have an integration. We will not be just average people. We will be normal people. We will be the human being who is free. We will be the free man. We will no longer be a slave to our mistakes. And being free of our own mistakes, we are now free to become masters of the liberal arts and sciences. We are free to settle down to the conscious problems of self-improvement. Now, I insist that this is possible, even though it may not be consistent in every respect with the daily problems that we face. The mere fact that there is this inconsistency, and that to a certain measure the problems around us cannot be changed, that the importance of changing ourselves is brought home to us. We each of us live in two worlds, a world of things around us and a world of things within us. In the world of things around us, it appears that we have to follow the advice of Jesus, who said, Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but unto God the things that are his. And we have this twofold life. We have to render certain service. Uh, to the material world to which we belong. If we do not, others must do our work for us, and this is not right. But we also have a certain responsibility to an inner life, and there is, there is no one who cannot do something with his inner life, even while he is living in the outer world. He has some way of compensating. Home is a compensation, unless it is destroyed. All forms of avocational creative activity can be compensatory, unless we choose them so badly and practice them so unwisely that they are meaningless. But always, everywhere, the individual can begin this solemn quest of the beautiful. He can live in a determination to improve his own consciousness release it into manifestation through conduct. He has several things he can do. Realizing that universal law is beauty, that what we call virtue is moral beauty, that harmony is tonal or structural beauty, that uh, value is aesthetic beauty. Realizing all this, we can slowly eliminate from our practice by personal endeavor those things which in themselves are obviously not beautiful. Things which dis deform, disparage, or destroy beauty are simply not safe for us uh, to do. And uh, little by little we realize that while we are at outs with everyone else, we cannot be at ends with ourselves. We cannot have peace of soul while we live in a conflict relationship with life. Now we may say that other people have imposed upon us. We may say that other people are unkind. These things may, as far as we know, be absolutely true. But at the same time, if we permit these happenings to come into our inner life, we are going to wreck ourselves. The thing that the other person did to us is not what is making us sick. It's the fact that we cannot handle the incident. We cannot transform this incident into something valuable. We cannot uh, rise above the occurrence in our own consciousness. If we could, it would no longer be a source of problem. So that's one area in which we try to accomplish something. And we need example, we need help in this. We need the moral support of the firm realization that there is good, there is beauty, and there is truth at the root of life. To find this, we simply have to tune it in for it is always here. To find it, we must acknowledge it, admit it, reflect upon it. 
And the moment our consciousness turns in that direction, the futility which binds us breaks its bonds and we are free. The actual fact remains that man can discover anytime, anywhere, that the universe is just. He can know as an inner experience the inevitable victory of good over evil. He can inwardly understand the mystery of his own immortality. These things can be achieved within himself, not necessarily by a great laborious program of self-improvement, but by a very simple relaxing away from darkness and toward light. It merely means a refocusing of interest and attention. Sometimes it merely means doing something, because it is in this nothingness of our activity that worries and sorrows and griefs take over. Nearly always the person most burdened with negations is simply the person who has no available store of positive consciousness. He is, has nothing good to think about. That is why he can be easily moved into a negative attitude. Rather than this, let him have good things to think about. This in itself will use up time and energy and free him from the, uh, from the occasion which will permit him to go into the doldrums. I know cases very definitely where persons have gone home to an empty apartment night after night and come very close to a complete nervous breakdown. They went into a dark room where no one was waiting for them. They got more sorry for themselves every day. Uh, they got in there and they found nothing but a bunch of apartment house uh, furnishings with nothing personal, nothing of value to them as individuals. They sat down in front of a radio they hardly knew anyone to call on the phone, and in a little while these lonely people became the absolute victims of their own isolation. For in that dull, gloomy atmosphere, untouched by the light of any value in themselves, except self-pity, they gradually went to pieces, until actually it was necessary to take heroic steps to get them out of these places. They couldn't recover themselves. They sank deeper and deeper into the slough of despond with every passing day. They didn't want to go home anymore. They actually were afraid to go home. I've had people here come to see me within the last three months who actually admitted they were afraid to go home. Not because of an ogre there, but because of nobody there. One of them said if the devil was there, it would help. It was simply this situation of there being nothing but themselves to live with, and their own condition extremely incompatible. Now, there's, there's no reason why the development of value in a life like that cannot be just as complete as the development of non-value. By a series of negative, meaningless, worthless attitudes, they got themselves into a situation in which they were in danger of, their, of losing their sanity. If you can do this to yourself to hurt yourself, it is also well within the power of everyone to do even more than that to themselves that will help them. Actually, the whole situation lies in attitudes. And it is perfectly possible for this individual to find in this little room his own world, a world where there are th countless beautiful things he can do and think. But he's dependent on the wallpaper and the furniture to do it for him. This isn't what happens. It is the light within himself. Even though the furniture might be a little off color, if his own light strikes it, it'll look much better. The real darkness is not in the room, but in his own nature. But where it is dark in him and dark in the room and the two darknesses come together, there is great misery. But this person could, in some way, make this little world a haven of rest and protection 
a place where there is no longer any need for subterfuge, where pretense is unimportant, where we don't have to cater to the whims of people who don't understand, but strangely in this little dark room we find freedom. We find the right to be ourselves. The only trouble is we don't appreciate the freedom because we have really no consciousness of what kind of selves we want to be. We, the, the self that meets us in that room is not pleasant, but it could be. Because actually, this is our leisure, this is our time. So we go about trying to do something about it. One individual tried to solve it, and to a measure did solve it. The moment they got home, they turned on all the lights, turned on the radio at the top sound that the neighborhood would permit, and immediately got frantically busy doing something. This was regarded as a positive therapeutic step. They felt pretty proud about that. Of course, they kept this up until they fell into a complete exhaustion and then went to bed. They went to bed a little too early. They didn't sleep all night. Here was nothing. Another person said, well, I've got it solved. I come home, put on a nice, soft light, slip on some nice, comfortable things, and then I sit down and read. These individuals have read thousands of pages, not really because their primary object was to know something, but their primary object was to forget themselves. So they read, and they read, and they read. But you would think that sometime, with that amount of reading, they'd graduate, but they never did. <laughs> Ten years later, they were still reading, and they, they still didn't dare put the book down. Because after ten years of reading, they now had a habit, and all they had to do was stop reading and be utterly miserable. They didn't know what else to do. So here were all these kinds of mechanisms by which the person is trying to rationalize the fact that perhaps he'd like to come home to a nice sunny situation with a house full of friends and everything would be gay and wonderful. Actually, many people come home to that also and are totally miserable. So it, uh, there's, no, there's no guarantee on this one way or another. There's, uh, there is no proof that if these people had others around them, they would be any different, but they think they would. And that is a consolation in their souls anyway. But here is the chance for beauty. Here's a chance... Uh, perhaps for a little creative self-expression, which helps tremendously. Instead of reading or turning on something or listening to something, you do something so that your own conscious activity is involved. This is very vital to, me to most people, particularly those who do not have very well-occupied lives. But there's also this constant coming to appreciate now, to appreciate, you have to have meaning and purpose. You have to build a little conspiracy, a benevolent one, in your life. Otherwise, things don't operate. Now, here's one example that uh, why I think art helps in these things, and why art uh, has been uh, uh, closely related with, uh, to uh, Shabui for hundreds of years. An individual who takes an interest in art begins to get questions. He goes down to a little store somewhere and he finds a mysterious little something or other. Uh, with our Western perspective, we're not quite sure what it is. But it's rather intriguing and it's within our price range. In fact, it's been marked down, which makes a very great inducement to purchasing it. Uh, and we get it. And it looks like it might be interesting. So we stand it around somewhere and in the course of time this little thing begins to cry out. What do I mean? Who am I? Why have you got me? After a little time, this kind of nagging situation that sets up maybe sends us to the library or to the bookstore to buy a book about it. We'd like to know what we have. Perhaps we start out and hoping that we have a treasure that is worth enough for us to retire on. Usually we will be disillusioned on that point. But it does offer an intriguing situation. And we discover that we have 
Well, perhaps we have a sword guard. We didn't know what it was. It looked a little like a napkin ring, but it turned out to be a sword guard. But it was rather interesting. It was interestingly shaped, nicely designed, a lot of artistry on it. So we took this sword guard, Otsuba, and we, we got a book on it. And we hadn't had the book for all long before we suddenly realized that there was a whole world of this subject. That the art of these uh, guards, tremendously interesting that they were adorned with the most wonderful symbols, that the symbols meant something, and that all kinds of designs of philosophy and art and literature of Buddhism, of Shintoism, of Taoism, are on these sword guards, and that they were made at different times, and that some of them are signed, and some of the artists were very interesting people. And if you happen to find one with this artist's signature on it, uh, suddenly it seems as though a bridge may be built across three centuries and we seem to touch the interesting dramatic person who created this object long ago. Little by little we, we begin to get intrigued by it and uh, the first thing you know we come home and we, we're kind of anxious to get home because we, we'd like to go a little further into that subject or we rush home and uh, have a quick meal and rush down to the public library so we can find out something more about our little purchase. And little by little, this thing leads us. Perhaps after a little while, we decide that sword guards are not the thing we've always wanted to collect, but we've now become aware of collecting. And in the course of reading the sword guards, we find there are only chapters in larger books on other subjects, and something else catches our eye. Pretty soon, we want to begin to know about these things. Uh, we decide that it might be nice to have several good examples. Well, that opens another problem. They've been copied badly, and most of them are probably forgeries. How are we going to protect ourselves? How are we going to know a good one? We have to study it. We have to study to know a good painting, study to know a good print, study to know a, general, a genuine piece of old ivory, study to determine the quality of jade, study to know whether a bronze was made last year and buried or whether it's really 300 years old. The challenge of this thing begins to catch up to us and the world begins to open. A world which is essentially a world of the search for real values, a world of discrimination in which we begin to learn why simplicity is great, a world of observation where if we overlook a minor detail we may be victimized, Gradually, the whole process of life becomes more thorough. And we don't do this very long before somebody drops by and says, My, you have an interesting collection of these things. And then you're in your element. Then you can explain them all. You've studied them for three months and you're an expert. Whereas the other person hasn't studied them at all and stands in awe of your learning. Uh, perhaps, however, somewhere along the line, he asks an embarrass embarrassing question, and after he's gone, you're back again trying to find the answer to that one. But you have slowly built a world. Now, you can say to yourself, well, this isn't an important world. No one really cares whether I collect sword cards or not. But it's a little more important than to be able to say, nobody cares whether I worry myself to death or not. Because actually... Uh, whenever you learn, you are adding to the complete structure of your own knowledge. A two-week expedition into, into Chinese ivories may be a little facet way away from your common life. But from the time you have understood these things that much, and have given that amount of time to them, they become a part of your total psychic chemistry. You are a little more wise. You are a little better judge of something. You are a little more observant. And this affects your entire consciousness. And as this develops gradually, you begin to, to sense value. And if you have friends, you begin to select between these friends. If you have an interest, you are not interested in uninteresting people. And people who are constantly interested in uninteresting people generally worry together or fuss together, or devote themselves to tearing down somebody else's reputation. But if you are interested in interesting people, you will learn something from them every day. Of course, you can learn from the uninteresting ones too, but that is a negative type of lesson. It's a constant warning saying, be not like them. 
But it is much often much more interesting uh, to find that as your own consciousness stretches out into a positive pattern of some nature, you begin to contact others who have done the same thing, who have similar interests, who are also on that level of understanding. And first thing you know, you have a very interesting kind of life. I know a man lived alone for a great many years, and uh, someone asked him one day, he said, aren't you a little tired of living alone the way you do? He said, I certainly am not. He said, the only thing that worries me is I don't have time enough. Every, he said, every evening I have my interests. I'm doing something. I'm researching something. I'm creating something. I, I know that I'm not going to be here too much longer, and I'm going to get all the information I can before I go. He says, I sit down with one of my little projects, and he says, heavens, I look at the clock, one o'clock in the morning. You know, the whole evening's gone. He says, a little bit uh, guiltily, I crawl into bed. You know, the question with me is not, how long am I going to sit alone in this room? The question with me is, uh, am I going to stop long enough to sleep? Everything is interesting. Into this little room, he had brought a world of interests, a world of creative things. And this person, you seldom have ever heard him complain about anything. He wasn't critical of other people. He had found a very interesting and delightful creativity. And time was just too short for him. He begrudged the hours he slept, because they interfered with things that he liked to do. But it all happened in an inexpensive one-room apartment. He didn't have any wealth, he didn't have any of these things, but he had interests, and within a moderate area, he was able, by economizing in other matters, to serve these primary interests. And they were so strong in him that the economies didn't mean anything. They were what he wanted to do. Everyone can do this to some degree, and it will make them better philosophers. It will make them more understanding, more sensitive people. You study some of these subjects for six months, and then someone starts talking to you about Zen, and you have a knowledge of it you cannot have otherwise, because perhaps you have worked with objects that were created by Zen artists. You know now why they did them the way they did. You sense something of the feeling of meditation from the very object. You have found friendship in it. You have found satisfaction of soul, because the person who designed it had that satisfaction of soul himself. He was able to put it in. And it's perfectly possible for an expert to tell almost immediately the degree of enlightenment of an artisan or an artist in any product that he makes. So little by little, this light of life shines more brightly. Problems slip, slip away. We don't have time for them. Worries are not as obsessive as they used to be. Instead of that, we have a constant enjoyment. And out of this, much better psychological integration. The happy person is capable of a good religious life. The unhappy person is not. The individual who is driven to religion by his miseries is a poor candidate. The individual who comes to religion because he, he joyfully uh, wants the experience of religion is an entirely different problem. In uh, the, for instance, in many of the Japanese Buddhist sects, um, uh, the sect founded by Honin is one of the most outstanding examples. Throughout Buddhism, no one ever prays for anything. They simply pray in the sense of making a statement of gratitude. A prayer is an offering of words. It is not a requirement. Just as a man brings a little bowl of rice or a little fruit to the altar. He brings of what he has and gives. He is not there to gain, he is there to give. As uh, Honan, before his passings, pointed out, uh, that actually there is only one attitude we need to take toward the universe, and that is the attitude of gratitude. There is nothing that we actually need that is not available to us if we are willing to earn it and to live the life that makes it possible. 
We don't have to be, uh, to, be, to be praying for the forgiveness of sins. If we're real people, we'll correct our own mistakes. The Buddhist does not believe in forgiveness of sin in the ordinary sense that we mean in the West here. Buddhist doesn't believe in saying, Dear Lord, I, I need uh, some supper money. Uh, this isn't his idea of religion at all. His religious concept is that the creating power of the universe has fashioned him, equipping him with the most marvelous instrument that the world has ever known giving him within himself the power to gaze into the heavens, to contemplate the mystery of his own existence, to understand life about him, to work and to play and to bear children and to make a rich and beautiful region for himself, to have a little home and a rice field. And on the days of feasting and celebration, he has the right to go out with his family and sit under a beautiful tree somewhere and look at Fujisan. What more is there that any reasonable person can ask? Therefore, why should we request things? We do not ask to live longer because we know we cannot die. Death is merely a change of worlds. We do not ask other people to be kind to us. It isn't necessary. Our only problem is, are we kind to them? And if we are right in our own hearts, we will be protected by our own attitudes. There is nothing that we can ask for that we cannot earn, that is not available to us if we live right. Therefore, we, the Buddhist simply makes some little statement like the Nembutsu, adoration to Amida Buddha, and that is his prayer. He may repeat it several times, deeply concentrating upon the blessedness of the life he has known, of the good things that have been possible to him, of the simple fact of, of his own life. He has been a conscious being. He could reach out and touch the world. He could reach out and bridge intervals. He could sit with his friends and drink tea and write a poem. What more is there? All this other is just simply confusion. Well, we can't completely simplify it away, but I think even this attitude on prayer certainly carries kihin in it. It has great moral value. It is the, not the idea that man is a slave or a servant of the universe, that he must ask for everything that he needs. Actually, he already has everything that he needs. All he has to do is guard it wisely and lovingly. The world has produced everything that is necessary to him. It is his own foolishness and his own selfishness that has made trouble, and that alone he can cure. Now before the Ravala, Buddha called his disciples together, and he said, My brethren, I leave you with this admonition. Work out your salvations with diligence. Each individual must save himself from himself. This is the law. So with this, what more is necessary except the gracious fact that we can stand as human beings and admit to the sovereign power that we know we are blessed, that we know and appreciate the wonderful mystery of our own existence. Therefore, it is necessary for us to beg. It is only necessary for us to realize the Bodhisattva ideal, namely, that it is our right to give, to share, to make a beautiful world, to help all who need, not because we come as an answer to prayer, but simply because this is the way that is natural to the enlightened human being. It's all so simple, and we've made it so complicated. So in our daily living, perhaps we are especially fortunate if we do not have too many personal problems crowding in on us. Uh, perhaps if we are just a little on the lonely side, we are especially blessed because we have freedoms that perhaps we wouldn't have 
had we more immediate responsibilities. If we have earned these freedoms, they are good, but they are not good if they are the result merely of evasion. One example of this freedom, all through Asia, India, every other country recognizes it, is the freedom that comes to the family when the children grow up. Uh, by the time the children reach majority, uh, the family now enters into its most fruitful period. Every essential duty to society has been met. The man who was brought into the world has paid his debt. The family has met the responsibility that the ages invested in them. And from that time on, there is freedom. There is always a certain loving watchfulness, certainly. But uh, the, the last thing in the world these people want to do is move in on their children. The last thing they want to do is to try to continue to keep their grown children, teenagers, and do all their thinking for them. This is not uh, key, key heen. This is not moral value. The moral value is now that the individual has the right, uh, not by neglect, but by desert, to create his own inner life, to have more and more opportunity to mingle consciousness with the stars and with the growing green things of life so that to be brought to the point where we can devote our lives to the improvement of consciousness without slighting anything else without failing in any responsibility this is a most blessed achievement and today in our Western world it is one of the most tragic things that can happen because we are utterly unprepared for it. We are unprepared to recognize the marvelous privilege of being able to direct our own lives toward the legitimate attainment of this right of the free man, the right to grow. When we are lifted of responsibilities, we are like the Roman who has been freed. And by this circumstance, we are entitled to go on to the contemplation of the great arts and sciences, which are the roots of universal knowledge. It's all in the attitude. It's all in the way in which we face things which we should be faced with graciousness and understanding. So if we can make that little change in our own perspective of, toward life, we find that we do walk in the light, and that life is a gracious experience, and that everything that happens is a, is a marvelous initiation in value. And this, if we can realize it intimately in our own lives, will it contribute not only to happiness, but to health, and to practically every uh, important objective of our lives. I think we should give it an awfully deep concentration and give it a lot of real thinking because it means an awful lot to Western man and will mean more before this century is over. Well, time's up, so we have to stop with this little uh, rumination that we've been carrying through the last several evenings.